you're listening to Text Me When You Get Home, a comedy podcast that discusses all things true crime and creepy. We tell you stories about murder, alien abductions, paranormal events and other spooky and macabre stuff. I'm Sophie. I'm Craig. And I'm Sean. Do us a favour, uh, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you usually listen. It would mean a lot to us. If you watch on YouTube or Twitch, like the video. And also, I feel like I'm being a bit threatening. Like the fucking video. Do, do us a favour. <laughs> to be fair, as soon as you said do us a favour, I got flashbacks of you being like in the office and being like, do us a favour and fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> that does sound like me, yeah. Um just FYI, we also have mini episodes where we read the latest spooky news stories or listener stories that on Spotify. Look, I know we said we would do uh, the next Extra Ghoulie, but I had a prior engagement. We had to move it again. So next week, we are off. The week after, business as usual with normal episodes and Extra Ghoulies. We can only apologise. I didn't mean for it to happen. We did intend to have an Extra Ghoulie last week but it is what it is okay i'm sorry so now to get on with the episode from craig what are you telling us about oh so this week is um (laughs) (laughs) i was a bit unprepared there um (laughs) i don't know if you noticed what character came out of you (laughs) um (laughs) there was a bit of fancy Uh, (laughs) um so this week I was I've been sent a few episodes from a friend uh, from my friend Matt. Yes, Sophie, I have a friend. Just you. the one. I have many friends. This is this is one of them. So able-bodied seaman Matthew um, has he sent me a few, and because I was on a tight deadline, this is a it's quite a short episode. It's a fabled last words. So I'm going to start. I'm going to start in ten ninety one. When the first treasurer for York Minster was appointed. When the office was established by the Archbishop of York. So he was the controller of the finances of the Minster. And he was required. uh, He required. The (coughs) Minster. (laughs) The first treasurer of York Minster was appointed in 1091. When the office was established. It sounds like you need to take a big poo. (laughs) Maybe he does. Maybe he does. does. Well, that was rude. I'll start again. (laughs) The first treasurer of York Minster was appointed in 1091 when the office was established by the Archbishop of York. As the controller of the finances of the Minster, the treasurer required a grand residence to be able to entertain important guests. And so they built the treasurer's house. Have you ever been to the treasurer's house, Sophie? Nah. Are you sure? No. No. (laughs) If I have, if I have, I've, I've never actually been into it. Probably walked past it, if anything. It is. I'm not a geek. <laughs> Just kidding, I am. <laughs> she says doing a podcast dedicated to. I know. The, I know. A modern geek thing. So that's that was it. That was 1091. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to jump forward to. Uh, <laughs> you said it was going to be a quick episode. Bloody hell! That's so it. So now it's 1092. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to fast forward. Um, 950 years ish to uh, to the 22nd of February 1953 when a young plumbing apprentice named Harry Martindale was working in the basement of the treasurer's house in York so the residence served in its capacity until 1547 as the as the actual treasurer's house of the of York Minster uh, until the reformation of the English church brought the job of the treasurer to the end to an end um, what does a what does a treasurer usually do? What is that job? So he was appointed um, by the Archbishop of York to look after the finances uh, and basically make sure it was just res- for the city. No, for the um, for the cathedral. Well, for the the min- for York Minster. Okay. Um, so was this at a time where the people could like um, the Pope could the Pope had issued? Um, so there was a time where you could basically pay your way into heaven. For like various pardons and things like that, is that the same same kind of time? Or oh, it's probably a bit early. Well, it's ten ninety one when the when something. the appointment was made. So, you know, it's uh, William the Conqueror's domain, oh, isn't it? Probably way too early then. And he's uh, it, at the time. I don't know if it was then, but even now, there's like four archbishops or something, isn't there, in the English Church? 
It's York, Durham, I don't know. Canterbury. Canterbury, and another one. I don't I can't, Where is the other one? Okay. Coventry? I can't remember. Can't be Coventry because they bombed the cathedral. I can't remember. Sure. But um, York, the Archbishop of York was pretty much the second highest uh, bishop in the land after right, Canterbury. Okay. Um, and so that, yeah, that job and that house served in that capacity until 1547 during the Reformation, uh, which brought the job of the treasurer to an end. The, the, the last treasurer surrendered the treasurer's house to the crown on the 26th of May and it was granted to uh, Protector Somerset by whom it was sold to the Archbishop Robert Holgate so it moved from Catholic to C of E right, okay. uh, Thomas Young was Archbishop between 1561 and 1568 and his descendants are responsible for the, tr- the structure of the house as it is today in the early 17th century the Young family added um, a symmetrical front and almost entirely rebuilt the house. So it was a really, really old sort of stone-built house. Now it's quite gothic, right. um, but a stunning house. If you've not, if you've been to York, it's literally behind the Minster. Um, oh right, okay. In 1617, the treasurer's house played host to royalty when Sir George Young entertained King James I. Um, and if you, uh, I, I preempt, uh, yeah, I've kind of shot myself. A little bit early there, because my next line was, if you've ever been to York, <laughs> you'll know the house. Um, it's a stunning huge house and gardens right in the middle of the city next to York Minster. Um, and it's just filled with history. It It's now a National Trust property after it was gifted to the trust in 1930 by the then owner, a man named Frank Green, who was a, um, a wealthy uh, businessman. Um. But what I want to tell you about is some of the more famous ethereal residents who reportedly reside there today. <clears throat> so, back to the 22nd of February, 1953, and the National Trust had decided to have a bit of renova- renovation work done. <laughs> God, <sorry>. Renovation. <laughs> a bit of renovation work. A bit of renovation work done to the house, which included a new boiler. Harry Martindale was an 18-year-old apprentice plumber who'd been sent into the basement to do some repair pipe work in the cellar. He was the most junior member of the team, and so, of course, it was his job to work down in the dark cellar to do all of the the dirty work. I think the job he had was actually to smash through a solid stone ceiling so that the pipes could run down into the basement. Right, okay. Um... So he was told to knock through this hole in the ceiling for the, for the pipes to come through. So he headed down down into the cellar with his ladders. And it's quite a run to get down into the cellar. It isn't just downstairs. This house is massive and it's down a corridor, down some stairs, down another corridor, down some stairs. It's it's quite a long run back up. Is that where would have, uh, the help would have lived or is that not the kind of house? It, it, it's even below that. It's like a proper, right. it's a proper like medieval looking cellar. Oh, right. Okay. Um big big stone foundations not not at all what you would imagine like not like my persimmon new build (laughs) no and not like you'd imagine from um where the servants would live with bells and all that sort of stuff it's literally imagine like a dungeon that's that's the kind of place you it's like it's like where you keep your victims sean i don't have a cellar anymore let's get rid of yeah, the, rent, the rent was ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> Complaints from the neighbours are doing me, Plus, damp doesn't really keep them fresh. Yeah. <laughs> no, not, not fresh enough anymore. You don't want a soggy victim. No. They start no. to get mould on them after a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. Can't abide mould. So, as Harry got into the cellar, he noticed that there was an excavation trench in the cellar due to some recent archaeological work. It was a perfect place for Harry to pop up his ladders because it was the only even part of the floor. Um, and so that's what he did. He pops, he props the feet of the ladders into the trench and he leans them against the wall and he climbs up to start his work. Now, Harry had been toiling away at this uh, stone roof for about four hours when he hears a strange musical sound. He assumes it's the radio playing. Go on, Sophie, what were you going to say? I was going to ask what did that <laughs> musical sound sound like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All very strange. That is a strange musical sound. 
So he assumes it's the radio plane from one of his colleagues working down the several the series of halls, so he ignores it, but the sound gets louder. <clears throat> As the sounds get sound gets louder, he notices something strange about the sound. It's not a musical note or somebody singing. It's the same single note being played over and over, like somebody blowing into a horn or trumpet. <laughs> So uh, the sound gets louder still, and Harry, high upon his ladder, leaning against the sun, a solid stone wall, looks down below him between his legs to see <laughs> <coughs> to see a Roman soldier step through the solid wall. What? The soldier is wearing a full Roman uniform, a helmet with a plume of blue feathers, and Harry, absolutely shitting his pants, falls from the ladder and st- just quickly scrambles in the corner to hide. There's something really strange about the soldier. He doesn't seem to notice Harry at all as he walks through the basement and he seems only visible from his knees upwards. The soldier with the blue plume walks through the room and as he gets to the trench, it seems that his legs appear before he walks through the wall on the other side of the cellar from where he entered. Wow. So, so, yeah, so he's like walking through. You can't see... He's anything below his knees, gets to the trench, you can see his feet. And then as he gets out the trench, <laughs> goes through past the trench and through the other wall, his knees disappear and then his whole body disappears through the other wall. Is anyone else yeah. just uh, imagining a really chunky Roman soldier just because of the sound effect? Just, 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 <laughs> just with his like uh, shield. No, what they call, what's the metal? Um, Tunic? I don't know. Just like bursting from the scenes. <laughs> if maybe maybe don't imagine a trumpet, maybe a horn, like I did, like. Purr. <laughs> okay. I, it means nothing. Um. <laughs> no, they have trumpets. <laughs> I was. I know. I would know. <laughs> these are, these are jazz Romans. And um, the one at the back with a recorder. <laughs> <laughs> a flute. <laughs> So Harry, absolutely terrified by this event, gets up to leave the cellar, but he hears the sounds of horses' hooves now. A large horse, mounted by another Roman soldier, walks through the wall. This soldier has a large circular shield over his left arm, and again, the horse's legs can't be seen until it enters the excavation trench. Harry said the horse was strange, not like a riding horse of the day, but much larger and with bushy fetlocks around its hooves, like a shire horse or a dray horse. Oh. So like a massive horse, not not uh, not one that you would see running around, running a derby. Yeah. The horse disappears through the wall, but Harry still can't leave because now he hears marching footsteps and a whole column of Roman soldiers mm. in pairs walks through the wall and Harry counted about 19 to 20 soldiers in total. Again, each of the feet can't be seen until they enter the trench and the first of the column of the soldiers is carrying a wind instrument Probably the one he heard earlier before the apparitions arrived. And here you go. Harry said that he was so close to the soldiers that he could hear them talking to each other, but it wasn't a language that he could understand. Um, so it, he was remember he's eighteen year old. He's plumber, plumber's apprentice. What year was this? Sorry. This was uh, nineteen fifty three. All right. Okay. So. Um. 18-year-old Harry later gave a very detailed account of the attire of the soldiers um, and he described the men as small in stature, wearing leather jerkins, green tunics just below the knee, carrying short swords and a few of them had spears and almost all of them had circular shields on their left arms. What's a jerkin? um, Like a little leather pouch, isn't it? That goes around your waist and hangs above your crotch imagine like a like, like a fanny pack like a um sporran a fanny pack <laughs> yeah like, like <laughs> you're saying more words that i don't know speak so sporran's what um you have in front of your kilt ah uh, right i see what you mean yeah like a an, fanny pack <laughs> yeah an old-fashioned bomb bag so the yeah. phrase harry specifically used to describe them was scruffy soldiers because many of them were unshaven and covered in mud Ah. Okay. 
He also described the soldiers as completely solid, not ethereal, not misty, not cloudy, or not transparent, but as solid as you or I, which is why he was so terrified and why he thought the whole thing was weird, because they were, they just looked like people. Right. Wow. That's, I've never heard someone experience something that doesn't appear like non ethereal. Yeah. That's the way I would pitch them. It's just like when you described that you couldn't see their parts of their legs, it's like because they were just simply faded out oh. rather than just being completely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm floating. Oh. That's my ghost noise. It's a good one. Thank you. <laughs> so he's, um, imagine him now, he's sort of trapped in the corner of the room just waiting for this like massive entourage of Roman soldiers to get through. As soon as the last one leaves, he can hear them walking away so he can still hear them and still hear them marching and talking and the horn blaring and as soon as the the noise stops he sprints as fast as he can across the cellar through the tunnel up the stairs and into the main building you'd be going up those stairs three three apiece wouldn't you yeah you'd be making your own (laughs) trumpet noises wouldn't you they're following me they're following me (laughs) do you know what i like to think about um so those romans on say it is real um, cause we know that we're kind of skeptical, but say it is real and they are actual soldiers. Maybe that they were there and they were walking past and one of them saw a weird looking boy on the floor and they're like, Oh, did you see that boy ghost? Maybe that's what they're talking about, Sophie, that you can't understand. Like, yeah. Don't the corner. Yeah. <laughs> I like to think about the fact that they might've actually been there and like, I don't know. It's cool. <laughs> He said, "He in some accounts, he his accounts never changed throughout throughout all of the years. In fact, he didn't actually tell anyone for a long time. Um, he as he gets up into the main building, um, he doesn't speak to any of his colleagues. He just sits down and sort of like takes a moment. And the warden of the house, who's a who's an older guy, walks over to him and says, looks him up and down and says." By the state of you, young man, you must have seen those Roman soldiers. Fucking oh. <laughs> so. A bit of warning before I'm looking at <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Sending an 18-year-old lad down there and they know that there's some soldiers roaming about. So it, it, the warden wouldn't have sent them. He's just looking. He's just the guy who looks after the well-being of the house. It's the um, it's the rest of the plumbers, isn't it? Like, I know, but he could, like, been like, oh, he could have been like, he could have been like, oh, don't, don't send him, you know. Send that old it, one. They, they probably meant, to, you know, they probably knew about it and they sent him down because he was an eighteen-year-old boy and see if he could shit him up. Yeah, well, remember as well, he'd been working down there for four hours before this happened. Yeah, Not, and do, doing heavy <laughs> labour as well. Yeah, so, like literally back-breaking yeah. labour, smashing through stone. Because it was down near the boiler, too. wasn't it? Could there have been like a gas leak or something? Could have gas been installed yet? Could have been. Could have been uh, exhausted. Could have been anything. So you remember as well, the young family lived there for a long time. It probably wasn't gas; it was probably oil, if anything, in a place like a place that size. Um, Harry Martindale went on sick leave and never worked as a plumber again <laughs> for the rest <laughs> the connect, of his life. The correlation is because he it happened because he was a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what the Romans said about plumbers? They fucking ate them. <laughs> Follow him around wherever he goes every time he has a job. It's like, look at you, poncy modern people with your indoor plumbing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> didn't the Romans have indoor plumbing as well? Uh, I think only the thing he houses, didn't they? Particularly he? wealthy. Yeah. So Harry doesn't tell anyone about the encounter, nobody at all, thinking that nobody's going to believe him. But his friends start to harangue him to get back to work, um, which he just ignores, and eventually he's sacked. So he, got, he goes on sick. His mates are like, what the fuck are you doing? This is a really good job. Get back to work. And he's like, nah, nah, I, I, nah, I don't really want to go back to work. And then he gets the sack. Um, To give his friends some reassurance as to the fact that he hasn't just quit a great job for absolutely no reason, he tells a couple of them of the story on the promise that they don't tell anyone else because he feels ridiculous about the whole thing. Yeah. Harry's friends absolutely do not keep the promise. Um, <laughs> and thankfully because we wouldn't have this episode otherwise <laughs> well because the story is too good to keep for themselves soon the story gets around and eventually Harry's quizzed by the local papers historians arch- and archaeologists in York and he's quizzed about some of the fine details of the story 
So a few of these details mentioned were used to disprove the story at the time. So the carrying of swords on the right hand side and the use of circular shields couldn't possibly be correct. The Roman units assigned to York carried square shields. Um, they carried them with their right arms and they wore short sto- sh- they wore their short swords on the left. So completely the wrong way around. They didn't have a spears. They carried the swords on the other side and they had square shields, not circular ones. The units assigned to York also wore red tunics, not green ones, like Harry said, and so it must have been completely made up by the lad to excuse the fact that he was a lazy ass and didn't want to be a plumber's apprentice. Bloody hell. That's a scathing rebuke. How would he know to make it up? How would he know what to make up to lie about? Next well, time I'm in the office and I cannot it? be asked. <laughs> Whoa, did you see those Romans? 20 Roman soldiers just marched through it, right? With, with green circle tunics. shields. Yeah. Oh no, I, no, 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 that can't be right. They were always on the left. It's all on the left. And they were, they were red tunics, so it can't be true. Can't be true. No, so that, no, no. So that's it. Archaeologists and, you know, people from the university, all these experts were like, nah, mate, you're talking bullshit. Um, so he was wrong. Or was he? Because throughout the 80s... <laughs> I thought it was going to be the end of the story. Was like, and, uh, yeah, that's oh, it. The end of the story. He was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, <Poor> shy bastard. <laughs> remember, that was, in the, that was in 1953. But throughout the 80s and 90s, and, and right into the noughties, actually, major archaeological digs uncovered lots of evidence about the people who right, lived okay. in oh. the fort of Ebercorum, uh, which is the Roman name for York. And now we know so much more than we did in 1953 when Harry witnessed a legion walking through the cellar of the treasurer's house. During the last 30 to 40 years of Roman occupation in York, the main body of troops have all gone back to Rome, and the soldiers who are left to occupy the fort are reserve auxiliary troops. The right, troops, okay, that's why they look rough and scruffy. Yeah, so the, the troops who lived in York towards the end of the era with, were issued with green tunics, they wore their swords on their right-hand side in leather scabbards, and they were issued with circular shields. There you go. Was, the, um, was Harry... When, when were these discoveries, you say? In 50, the, 40 to 50 years later. So, it, it, so he sh- may, maybe was alive. Oh, so, yeah, no, he was absolutely alive to be vindicated. So in 1953, he told the story, 80s, 90s and noughties, all the archaeological evidence discovered that actually when during the fall of the Roman Empire, there weren't there weren't the fighting troops that we all associate with the Romans. It was auxiliary troops. They were basically like the territorial army that they'd left over. Yeah, they were still Latin. Um, They would they would have still been Latin Romans and locals. Um, but they wouldn't have been the same regime as the as the fighting forces mm. on the front line. Um, so throughout the course of his life, Harry Martindale recounted the story many times, never changed a single part of the statement. He always refused. Said, how would he have, uh, because the history has vindicated, well, I say the future then vindicated his story. It's, yeah. It's crazy that. And... Throughout his life as well, he always he was offered payments by various like newspapers and things like that. He always refused. He's never received any payment, never received any sort of fame. If anything, he got ridiculed for quite a long time for this mad story about mm. Romans walking through the wall. Yeah, it's ridiculed by um, people in the know, like the university yeah. professors, like the archaeologists. Yeah. Um, and then he's actually shown some greater insight that they they never had and they would never have potentially it's a i think for the for the bulk of his career as well he was a policeman so um oh really yeah really? after that so you know a lot of the time as well so hang on, hang on. he was too scared to be a plumber but he's <laughs> quite happy to become a policeman <laughs> yeah this is like 50s york though i can't imagine i my i've got a friend who's in the police force um for York. Is that, is that the same friend that talked no, about the story? It's a different friend. And he different mo- friend. Another friend. <laughs> Another oh. friend. Yeah. Friends are racking up quick. Are you sure you can keep up with them? <laughs> and he moved from the police force in Leicestershire for an easy ride. Because <laughs> he was like he now works for uh, for Yorkshire Police in York and it's like he's like, yeah, yeah, it's a to what a cake walk compared to the, the violence like, and is, monstrosities is it, is it like that live in Leicester. Compared to the, the yeah. tough streets of Leicester, is it? <laughs> I think so, yeah. 
Um, so what about the excavations? Well, the exca excavations that were going on in the basement at the time were part of earlier excavations that started years and years earlier when Frank Green still owned the house. Uh, Green discovered the Roman road. So it was actually a road that ran through where the house was built. Um, and it had four Roman column bases that ran underneath where the house was built, exactly at the foot level where Harry had seen the Legion walk, which would have been ground level in the 5th uh, century. Okay. 5th ah. century being the last time that the Romans... that that York was occupied by the Romans. The Romans. Um, one of the Roman columns remains in situ, so you can still go and see it in the cellar. And another one they lifted out of the cellar and used it as the base for a modern set of columns in the main hall of the house. So they sort of repurposed. They left one down yeah. there. I think two of them are in the York um, Museum, and one of them they used as, as part of the house structure. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, that that is it. That is the story of um, the treasurer's house. Like I say, it's going. So the, the warden who um, was sorry, wasn't the warden who um, spoke to the guy? Spoke to yeah, Harry, at the Harry. time. And and that, that, that it was just like he was a ghost in this story. It's like, oh, you've seen the Romans, have you? I'll be off. <laughs> Literally, I think the recounting of it, I couldn't find anything about him, but the recounting of it, it was Harry. He was like the warden was like, you must have, you must have seen mm. those Roman ghosts. So he's basically Maybe sat... Maybe he was a ghost as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's sat in the main hall. So that is the story of the Roman ghost. It's quite a famous story in York. Um, and has as no other reports of people seeing the Romans since? So um, th the family that lived in the house, um, the, the Green family, so these were in... Uh, Frank Green was an industrialist and he made his money and he bought the house did loads and loads of renovation work to it and his children reported seeing the Roman soldiers all the time okay. but he never mentioned it it's not something that he sort of talked about it's not it wasn't a known thing until Harry Martindale said I saw 20 Roman soldiers and a horse and car to walk right. through the um, walk through the basement yeah. um, and then there are various other ghosts in the house as well so it the building claims to be home to several other ghosts, including a dog, a black cat, uh, a black a black cat. Fucking hell, I can't speak today. Is it a black cap or a black a, cab initially? A black cap, I said. <laughs> <laughs> it's a ghost cap. <laughs> <laughs> so a dog, a black cat, um, a man called George Aylesby, who was the head of the house in the 17th century, and he was killed in a duel in the kitchen. A duel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would have thought they'd have done the duel outside. Yeah, I had to do it. Um, yeah, I thought they had to do it at city uh, city limits. Maybe it was just like fuck it, we'll do it now, right now. Yeah, um, yeah. I've had enough of you, you fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you fuck. Um, and Frank Green is also meant to haunt the house as well. The man who sort of re renovated yeah. it to what we know today. Um, he gifted the house in 1930 to the National Trust, and when he did so, he did so on the condition that the rooms were kept as intended. And he promised to haunt the building if any changes were ever made. Oh. <laughs> and of course, since then, some things have been moved. And it's said that some strange happen happenings at the house were Frank carrying out his promise. Um, the tapestry room in particular is reputed to have an oppressive atmosphere. And this is where the wife of a, a former owner murdered him after he conducted one too many extra extramarital affairs. Oh dear. Oh. So it's a house. I mean, it's a thousand-year-old house, so it's got it's got lots and lots of history. And obviously it's built in a main thoroughfare into York, um, where the Romans would have tried about as well, so yes. even prehistory. Were the walls built by the Romans? Were they by the Vikings? The walls of the house? No, the... the, the... The York, oh, the York walls, walls were built city. by the Romans, yeah. They're yeah. Roman walls, yeah. Um, so that's it. That's the story of the treasurer's house. Um, I was going to give go through a couple of other famous ghosts of York because uh, if you've ever visited as a tourist to York, there's like seven or eight different ghost walks you can do. Yeah, it's, it's famous. I've been on a ghost walk. It's like, yeah, York, Edinburgh. Um, Whitechapel. <laughs> They're pretty much like the places that you go for ghost walks, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. So the first one I'm going to tell you about briefly is a man called the Stick Man. 
Um, stick man. Yeah, and he's one of the oldest ghost stories of York, and he dates back to the late 18th century. So, author of The Life and Opinions of Tristram, Shan Tristram Shandy, a man called Lawrence Stern, lived um, for some years at 33 Stonegate, with the first two volumes of his fam famous novel being published from number 35, Now Haunted. Uh, the house next door to his, his had been occupied by an, by an aged gentleman who nightly feared that he would be robbed by intruders as he lay in his bed. To frighten them off, as the Yorkminster bells struck midnight, he used to bang his walking stick against the wall next to his bed repeatedly, thinking it would frighten off any would-be thieves. After his death, the knockings carried on. <laughs> oh, Christ, that's horrible. Um, at number 35, the adjoining bedroom to Stearns is now known as the seance room. <laughs> I'm just thinking... If, uh, you know, in the past I've said, oh, God, you wouldn't want to die in the, like, gynecologist table or <laughs> that sort of stuff because okay, of no. where your ghost... It would have been brutal if you did. <laughs> well, that... <laughs> well, I mean, like... I think you need a new the... gynecologist, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, that's where your ghost will always return on the gynecologist table, the legs of Kimbo. It would be, one, mortifying and also pretty... Uh, horrific for everybody else um but then also now i'm thinking like if i died what would my ghost noise be <laughs> that like flee flee <laughs> that, and like oh sophie's ghost is about probably be like joe will you put the kettle on <laughs> but, oh she's she's here the air's turned cold <laughs> um the Flying Book is another story that's quite famous in York. Um, so th this book as in something you read or book as, as, in, as in Yeah, yeah something you read. Right. Um, so the year of the Roman soldiers, that uh, the story of Harry Martindale was 1953. The Roman soldiers were not the most talked about ghost story in York that year. Um, it's only got more famous as time has gone on because it's been proved correct and the details have been proved correct. Yeah. The one that was famous at the time in 1953 was one of Edmund Wooler and the flying book in the Yorkshire Museum. The haunting was said to repeat throughout the year, then vanish again, recurring on a seven-year cycle, which is apparently what also happens with the Roman ghosts. Um, oh, really? Which means in 2023, it's the perfect year <gasps> for going to going ghost hunt, uh, hunting oh, in the city. There you go. So close. <laughs> so just to clarify, you're telling me that in 1953 in York, a flying book was worthy of more worthy of note than a whole troop of Roman soldiers marching through. Yeah, because he was ridiculed for it, and the flying book happened repeatedly in the right, museum. Okay. Um, <coughs> so the another one is the Ghost of York Museum. So unrelated to the flying book, still in the museum. Because you've got to remember the museum's the castle, isn't it? Um, it's the old castle in York next to Clifford's Tower, where uh, right, okay. um, where they, they burned all the Jews. It's not a nice story. Another story for another day. Another <laughs> story for another time. But home to one of the most infamous ghost stories is the York Castle Museum. Uh, in 1953, the museum caretaker... Uh, 1953 is a busy year for ghosts in York. <laughs> it is. Um, this guy, Mr. Jonas, uh, that was the caretaker, and he claimed to see a little man that he described as being dressed in Edwardian clothing. Um, and this happened shortly after Mr. Jonas and his wife locked the museum up after closing and returned to their accommodation in the basement. I couldn't imagine like living in a flat in the basement of the castle. No. As the pair settled down to relax, they heard footsteps in the museum above, and when Mr. Jonas went upstairs to check things out, he saw a man pacing the floor. Assuming the man had somehow gotten locked inside, he approached him and laid a hand on his shoulder and he went and he promptly disappeared. So oh. he, oh, he touched him and he vanished. <laughs> Christ. On another occasion, Mr. Jonas was with a colleague again after the museum was closed and the, and the same apparition of the Edwardian man made, the, made another appearance. This time it was witnessed by both men. And from time to time, new reports surface, but there's no information about who this man might be or why he's hanging around in the museum. If you Google the York of Ghost Museum, there's loads and loads of pictures. I didn't put them in the thing because none of them are very good. Right. <laughs> um, um, 
A couple more. The Roman Wraith is a sorrowful tale from start to finish. It's the story of Marmaduke Buckle. Um, Marmaduke? What a Marmaduke name. Marmaduke Buckle. And it's one of York's most noteworthy ghost stories. He was a physically handicapped man, um, but because he was living in the unforgiving 17th century, this meant that he was accused of witchcraft. What? <laughs> yeah. As a result, he spent most of his life hidden away in, the, in a house on Goodrum Gate in central York. Eventually, he decided he couldn't take it anymore. After carving his initials, birthday and date into a wooden beam, he ended his life by hanging himself at just 18 years old. Mm-hmm. It's said that his ghost still haunts the building and you can find him to this day slamming doors and flicking light switches. There are even rumours that he often tries to push people down the stairs in the pub next door. Ghost. In the pub. In, in the pub. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was the ghost. Fucking ghost. Marmaduke, you Marmaduke. <laughs> Ghosts do like pushing people down the stairs, don't they? The pesky Especially buggers. after 14 pints. They do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and the Golden Fleece. So if you do any ghost walks in York, they always tell you about the Golden Fleece. Uh, and it takes its pride of place as the reputation as York's most haunted hostelry. Uh, something one bar manager dismissed as nothing but tall tales for tourists when he was first hired. However, it wasn't long before... Oh, sorry, I said he. I meant she was eating her words. Just some of the things that she saw, heard and felt at the Golden Fleece while she worked there were an apparition moving across the bar before disappearing into the wall, the sound of footsteps, a bunch of keys rattling, and perhaps the most chilling of all, hands running up and down her spine. Oh, oh no. Pervy ghosts. <laughs> no say. Hands off ghosts. So that bar manager is not the only person to have encountered ghostly inhabitants at the Golden Fleece. Many guests report seeing a ghostly woman roam in the corridors and staircases in the early hours of the morning. Uh, investigators believe that this might be the spirit of Lady Alice Peckett, who was the wife of a former of a former Lord Mayor of York, who lived next door to the Golden Fleece when it was once a coaching inn. Uh, another spirit that's sometimes spotted is that of a Canadian airman who fell to his death from the upper windows. Um, and then finally, another man called One-Eyed Jack, who appears at the bottom of the bar in a 16th century red coat carrying a pistol. So yeah, that one's got loads of ghosts. And then I'm just uh, I'm just googling now where the Golden Fleece is, because um, is it still after public? Yeah, it's down the end it's of there. Um, yeah, it's down the end of what do you call it? Pizza Hut. <laughs> <laughs> just if there's anyone with my uh, my same tastes, it's near Pizza Hut. That's it. It just seems to be it's like wherever there's a location. I don't know where that is. Where's that? Oh, it's near near Pizza Express. I don't know where it is. Oh, near. Next- down for the Domino's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not well, not well. It's near Max and Spencer's, isn't it? Uh, yeah, but it's right at the end of um, the shambles. You, so as you walk down the shambles, it's the one that faces you. Yeah. Unless you come okay. out of the shambles. Hey, <laughs> I've walked past the Golden Fleece many times. I've never, never realised. You have to go in for a pint now. I will. Mm. And then the last one, the very last one, is Ye Old Star Inn, which is one of the most prominent drinking establishments in York. The bustling pub is one of the oldest in town, being established back in 1644. It's been a working bar since a working pub since 1644, and contains some areas such as the cellar, which date back even further. The cellar boasts as much history, if not more, than the pub the pub built above it because that dates back to the 10th century and it was used as a military hospital and mortuary during the brunt of the English War. Uh, A number of, uh, obviously York as well, took a battering during the English War, didn't it? The English Civil War, sorry. Uh, A number of ghosts are said to have taken up residence within Ye Old Star Inn over the years, with many considering it to be one of the most haunted places above the Golden Fleece. One of the most active areas of the building is said to be the cellar, and this makes sense considering of the history of it being used as a makeshift hospital and one of the most common and chilling paranormal occurrences happens within the cellar is the pound, the sound of people crying out in pain oh Christ <laughs> <in> the <hospital. laughs> well, yeah. imagine oh, it's like yeah Stella's off mate will you go down and change the barrel and you're like fuck no, no. <laughs> I'm just yeah. on uh, Google Maps now so, so for our listeners that don't know my parents live in York so this is a fun story for me because all of the street names I know 
so I'm just looking at ye old in ye old star in and as you're talking about like yeah it was a place for war victims or whatever there's just a big sign on the door saying proper pies made in Britain <laughs> <laughs> Um, it also says that it was established in 1644, which is wild. That's the good thing about going down York. You can tell, you can tell all of the buildings are so old. Like other is cities. This a, sorry, is this episode sponsored by York? Uh, <laughs> visit York. Dot com. Chorus board by, or something. Like by, that. Uh, yeah, but isn't it though? It's like when you're in York, it doesn't feel like you're in a city. It feels like you're in an old town, but yeah. just massive. I think the only reason New York's a city is because of the. Minster, the Minster and the University. I think it hits so many, uh, it hits so many check boxes, check, yeah. check boxes because of the Minster, um, but it doesn't hit it for population because it's not a very big city, is it? No, it's not big. Um, in the Yield Star Inn, there are plenty of other spirits that are said to dwell in there that are in keeping with the pub's history with the war, um, including the spirit of a royalist officer who roams, royalist officer who roams the premises, decked out in complete wartime apparel. That's some that, that's some civil war enthusiast getting up carrying yeah. on. Oh, that's just that's just Roger. Yeah. <laughs> Roger does that every Ignore week. him. Ignore him. Yeah. Don't then, encourage him. Don't encourage him. And then there are t- there are two more ghosts. One's an old lady dressed in black who's seen to descend in the staircase from the upper floors. That's fucking yeah. lady dressed in black's just creepy, isn't it? Um, and two ghostly black cats who are always seen around the bar. Uh, a local legend, legend states that the cats were bricked up inside a pillar that stands between the door and the bar because this was a regular custom back in the day. And it was. Um, I've heard of this, yeah. So they would they would brick up live cats into buildings. The cats would die there, and then the cat spirits would ward off evil spirits. Ah, oh, that's horrible. There are many reports of visitors bringing their dogs into the bar only to find them growling and snarling at the pillar. One dog oh, even fuck. managed to run so hard at the pillar, he knocked himself out. Aww. <laughs> I think I paid to see that. Um, <laughs> apparently, uh, this this practice of bricking up cats in a building is a superstitious one uh, that's found all across Yorkshire predominantly, uh, and it's said to ward off both fire and... Ill, both Ill, fire, ill luck, and evil spirits. <laughs> so it's one of the most haunted places in York. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next time, famous uh, house builders persimmon order like thirty thousand <laughs> <Yeah>. cats. <laughs> like, yeah. what, are you, what are you doing, John? Just off to Cattery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For new estate. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. That's my uh, story of some of the more famous that's ghosts great. of York. Sweet. Good job. So. Now for our YouTube and Twitch followers, we'll be showing you some pictures. Um, if you are listening on our podcast channels, head over to our Instagram and we will eventually share the uh, Im- uh, images from the show with you. The so, collective we have been very busy. Not lazy, <laughs> just busy. The collective we have. York Treasurer's House and the Roman Soldiers. So that's Harry Martindale on the <gasps> left. Oh, Harry, look, he's a cute old man with a suit <laughs> and tie on. And that's the cellar, and you can see where the, the torch is shining. That's the Roman road. So you can see why he was ah. like, you know what, I'm just going to stick my ladders here because yeah. it's not a very stable place, really, is it? That's all. No. Yeah, that's the treasurer's house. If you've never seen it, even no, though, even if you've no, lived in York for decades, never, never ever seen it. And this is the main house hall. So I think this is where Harry ran to and was sat, just sort of consoling himself when the warden was like, "Must have seen the ghosts, lad." Yeah, <laughs> imagine just walking across the hall, <laughs> being like, <laughs> didn't even stop breaking his stride. Here's another one. Um, so what you see there on the left. It, well, what you see, that's what an auxiliary Roman troop would have looked like in York, um, but with green tunics. So the shield is is what it would have looked like, but it's not. I can't remember what the, what's the, uh, it's not the shield for a shield wall. You know, the, the circle, the semicircle square. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not semicircle, the rounded square <laughs> uh, red ones that you imagine. 
and it's in the wrong end. That's the Golden Fleece, and if you if you do a ghost walk, that's not the window where the Canadian Airmen fell. It's the window above that. So, because uh, I'd have thought, I'd have thought, what a soft Canadian Airmen to fall out of there. And die. <laughs> but no, it's a right. it's a four story building. <clears throat> Um, oh, I see. So you fell from quite far up. And that's it. Nice. Nice. Right, I don't Stop sharing. Didn't have a great deal of content this week, but like I say, it was a quick one. Um, no, it was a good fun story. I liked it. Yeah, so you yeah were... I liked it. I liked because I know all of the places. It's just mad, it isn't it? Fun. It's like the fact that an 18-year-old as well. And... Yeah. I don't mean to disrespect Harry Martindale because he obviously he went on to be a policeman and stuff like that. But uh, and he he only died about I think he died about five years ago. But imagine like, imagine he wasn't massively well read on Roman history. <laughs> when yeah. It, when he was an eighteen year old plumber. So bit. when they were like, "You're lying!" Like, where where would he get those lies from? Yeah. Especially when it's the, the the learned people of York that are like, yeah. "All your facts this are wrong, it, dickhead." How would yeah. he have known? You know, even the even the, the the university professor has spent years studying this. Yeah, you know, archaeologists saying, that have been digging these buggers up. Yeah, you know, they're like, now nah, you've got the wrong shield, the wrong swords. They're on the wrong side, the wrong coloured tunics. Everything's wrong. And he's like, well, maybe he's colour bland looking in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you've cracked it. That's it. So that's it for today. We hope you enjoyed the story. Remember. Remember, remember, we're missing next week and then we're back. Business as usual, extra ghoulies galore and normal episodes the week after. So, ghoulies coming out your ears. Yeah. Ghoulies galore. Yeah, ghoulies (laughs) coming out of your every orifice. (laughs) Remember, everyone, be safe and text me when you get home. Bye. Bye. Bye.